everyone. Hi, I'm Casey Peluso from Parkinson Foundation in Western Pennsylvania, and thank you all for coming today to this special event with Dr. Ray Dorsey. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Supernus, and Bree, uh, Bree Rothy, or Rothy, is our represent local representative. She's in the back. There's a table outside, so please visit her. And um, I'm delighted to be able to to present Dr. Ray Dorsey, or Ray, he prefers to go by Ray. I'll give you just a brief introduction, and I think you're going to be really, um, really, uh, you really enjoy this presentation, and um, there's going to be time for questions and answers, so I know we're all excited. You'll get your books in the end as well. So Ray Dorsey is Professor of Neurology and Director of the Center for Human Exper Experimental Therapeutics at the University of Rochester Medical Center. He's investigating new treatments for movement disorders. He's also working on methods to improve the way care is delivered for individuals with Parkinson's and other neurological diseases. His research is published in medical and neurology journals. He's been featured on NPR, in the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. He completed his undergraduate studies at Stanford University and he completed his business school, um, his MBA, and his MD um, at the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you, Ray, for making the trip from Rochester, and um, I hope everyone enjoys today. Thanks very much to Casey and Christine for the invitation to be with you uh, today. So uh, how many of you know why you have Parkinson's disease? Why do you have Parkinson's disease, Mr. Neal? someone else. So um, why is it important to know uh, why you have Parkinson's disease? So I'm going to give you uh, three reasons. One, uh, some of you, how many are interested in a cure for Parkinson's disease? So uh, can anyone name a disease that we can cure medically where we don't know the cause? If we don't know what the cause of a disease is, can we cure it medically? So that's one reason. Um, two, uh, if we know what the cause is, it, it'd probably be pretty good to avoid getting ongoing exposure to that cause. So if you get diagnosed with lung cancer, what's the first thing the doctor's going to tell you to do? So if we don't know what the cause is, how do we know what we should be quitting? Uh, and then third, uh, wouldn't it be great to create a world where Parkinson's disease didn't exist? So uh, some of you uh, remember polio, and so today we live in a world largely free of polio, um, not because we can cure polio, but because we can prevent it. And that's because a group of ordinary Americans, who didn't look very dissimilar from you, uh, made their voices heard in the 1930s, had a march of dimes. 16 years later, uh, Jonas Salk, 17 years later, here in Pittsburgh, Jonas Salk announced uh, a vaccine for polio. None of us worry about smallpox, none of us worry about typhus, none of us worry about yellow fever. These are all gifts we've inherited from previous generations. And so uh, we have an obligation to receive these gifts, and we have an obligation to reciprocate, right? We have an obligation to give forward to future generations, and no one's going to be more motivated to get rid of Parkinson's disease than you. Because you know uh, the toll it, uh, it puts both on you and on your family members. So that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, you guys all know that Parkinson's is rising. I'm going to argue to you that Parkinson's disease is largely man-made, that this is a largely man-made disease. And because it's man-made, it can be human-ended. And thus that Parkinson's is preventable. Um, so everyone, well, most people know, I don't know if people uh, Dr. James Parkinson wrote the first major description of Parkinson's disease in 1817. So you can't find it in the Bible. You can't find, like, old presidents. You can't find George Washington with Parkinson's disease. You can't find old kings with Parkinson's disease. Because Parkinson's disease is a relatively new condition. Uh, Dr. Parkinson was 61 years old uh, when he uh, did wrote this description. So a few people in here are 61 years old. And you can imagine you're not going to write an essay unless it's something, you know, really new and really important. And he said, I'm describing something that's not been classified in the medical literature. So his tremor's been described. He described all these uh, uh, scientists who described tremor. But Parkinson's disease, the stooped over posture, the hunched over, 
the tremor, the tendency to walk really fast. This is something new. And so what's going on in uh, 1817? It's London. It's the height of the Industrial Revolution. London's the capital, and air pollution is rampant. So this is a picture of the London fog. Some of you watch The Crown, right? Do you guys watch The Crown? And so you know uh, London fog has uh, little to do with weather and everything to do with air pollution. 1847, it looks like modern-day Beijing. The air is so toxic, people are covering their mouths uh, from the toxic effect. You can't even see across the street. Um, since that time, uh, he described six people with the condition. Uh, 200 years later, the Global Burden of Disease studies estimate that six million people have the disease. So in the span of 200 years, you go from six to six million. I submit to you it's really hard to do that from a genetic cause. And uh, it's growing f uh, far faster than uh, aging can explain by itself. And if we, this group here, and people like me don't do anything, the number of people with Parkinson's disease will more than double in the coming generations. And if you look at the map of the world of, of people with Parkinson's disease, um, each color tells you the rates of Parkinson's disease. The areas of the world that are in red and orange have the highest rates of disease. So the areas of the world that are most industrialized uh, or use lots of pesticides have the highest rates of Parkinson's disease. Areas that historically have used very little pesticides or have not been industrialized have the lowest rates of Parkinson's disease. And countries that are undergoing the most rapid industrialization, India and China, have the fastest increasing rates of Parkinson's disease. Uh, China, for example, adjusted for age, the number uh, of people with Parkinson's disease has uh, more than doubled in the past 25 years. So uh, that's the rise of uh, Parkinson's disease. Now I'm going to make an argument to you that's largely man-made. And what does Ray mean by man-made? Uh, so if you look at lung cancer in the United States, lung cancer deaths in black in the early 1900s just didn't exist. So today, lung cancer is the leading cause of uh, cancer death uh, in the United States. And 120 years ago, 100 years ago, it just didn't exist. No one died of lung cancer. It was so odd that doctors took special notice when confronted with the case, thinking they'd be once in a lifetime oddity, they would never see it again. 25 years after cigarettes are introduced, uh, lung cancer becomes a clinical entity. 25 years after we stop smoking, lung cancer deaths. So that's a poster child for a man-made disease. Ah, but Parkinson's disease, what about the genetics of Parkinson's disease? So this is a study from Nature Review Genetics and my friend and co-author Bas Bloom uh, put this in order from the diseases that are most heritable, like type one diabetes, you know, uh, schizophrenia, and many of you, uh, you know, have families that have been affected by schizophrenia, highly heritable conditions, to the least heritable condition, Parkinson's disease. So how many of you have a genetic cause for Parkinson's disease? How many people have a family history of Parkinson's disease? So we've known for 100 years, we've known for 100 years that uh, only about 15% of people with Parkinson's disease have a family history of the disease. We've known for over 20 years because of research doc done by Dr. Caroline Tanner that environmental factors are the predominant uh, cause of uh, Parkinson's disease, and it's among the least heritable conditions out there. So I'm not saying that it's not heritable. There are some rare genetic mutations. About 15% of people carry these genetic mutations. Most of them are insufficient by themselves to cause Parkinson's disease. There have to be other factors to do it. And some of these genetic factors will explain why some people exposed to the environment factors develop the disease and why some don't. But if you want to know what the cause of Parkinson's disease, we should not be looking at our DNA. We should be looking at our environment for most people. So what are the causes of Parkinson's disease? This is it. This is your money slide. Three uh, top reasons. Air pollution, certain pesticides, and a dry cleaning chemical called trichloroethylene. So air pollution. So this is what's going on in London in 1817. Uh, increasing evidence links air pollution to uh, Parkinson's. And if you really don't want to get Alzheimer's disease, do not hang out in a polluted area. If you really want to concern about Alzheimer's, stay away from air pollution. Six leading preventable cause of death in, in, in the world cost each of us, each human in the United States, e each human in the world lives three years less because of air pollution. Each human in the world lives three years less because of air pollution. 95% of the world's population have exposure above doses deemed safe by the World Health Organization. Certain pesticides, Paraquat, um, and, and the Rotenone, as many of you know, Dr. Tim Greenemeyer did research on uh, Rotenone. 
uh, and these things uh, are linked to Parkinson's disease. Terror Plus associated with 150% increased risk of Parkinson's disease. Uh, China has banned this because it's so toxic, uh, but the United States continues to use it, and use is increasing. So they're spraying Terror Plus today in the fields in upstate New York, and they're spraying it on the farms of Pennsylvania today, even though the EPA says one sip can kill. And then trichloroethylene, really, really, really simple chemical. I keep it around with me everywhere. It's got six atoms. So most of you know that water is three atoms, H2O. So trichloroethylene is just six atoms, two carbon atoms in black, one uh, <laughs> hydrogen in black, I mean in white, and then three chlorine atoms in green, hence its name trichloroethylene. Uh, we, uh, yesterday, I'm a little bit odd, I went and visited East Palestine, o uh, Ohio, where the train accident. That's vinyl chloride, so it's got, instead it's got one chlorine atom instead of uh, three. And some of you know dry cleaning chemical has four chlorine atoms instead of three. And so trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene are associated with a 500% increased risk of Parkinson's disease. I'll say it again. Associated with a 500% increased risk of Parkinson's disease, and it causes cancer, and we still allow its use in the United States. Uh, so we'll go through these, each of these in a little detail. So this is air pollution. So how many of you have seen the TV series The Crown? Right? And so many of you remember the episode in The Great Smog uh, in 1952. Winston Churchill's the prime minister. And uh, this Great Smog, uh, intense air pollution in London kills 12,000 people, leads to mass hospitalizations, and four years later leads to the first Clean Air Act ever passed anywhere in the world as far as we know. Um, so you think that's bad. Uh, so if you look at, this is a map of uh, air particulate matter. So you know when you see smog, right, you can see little pieces of dirt and soot in the air, right? Anyone been to LA? You've seen, you can like see, you can actually see smog, right? You can actually see little pieces of dirt and soot. And that dirt and soot is called particulate matter. That's its fancy term. And so this is 1950 uh, London. Uh, and if you look at what it was in 1800, uh, London, it was twice as bad. So when Dr. Parkinson's walking the streets seeing these people with this new disease, air pollution had been around for about uh, 100 plus years and it's getting to be really bad. Air pollution in London in 1800 when Dr. Parkinson uh, was describing the conditions is exactly what's going on in Delhi today. So Delhi, India has had the, like among the worst uh, air pollution in the entire world. And so you can look, this, this looks very similar. And the nice thing, the good news, the silver lining, is you've seen pictures of what happened during COVID and how quickly the air cleans up. So they showed like pictures in India. You can see pictures where the Himalayan mountains, people saw the Himalayan mountains for the first time ever in India because air pollution went down. All preventable, all man-made. Pesticides, uh, so Paraquat, how much do we know about Paraquat? Do you know about Paraquat? So Paraquat, this thing is, Terrible, been around since the 1950s. Uh, it kills the most toxic weed killer ever created. It kills the weeds that Roundup doesn't. I'll say it again. It kills the weeds that Roundup doesn't. It's been used to commit homicide and suicide. One sip can kill. Over 30 countries have banned it. It's associated with a 150% increased risk of Parkinson's among farmers. China has banned it. United Kingdom has banned it, but still exports it to Brazil, Mexico, and the United States. And it's everywhere. So it's here in Western Pennsylvania. It's, I've uh, visited vineyards in Western New York uh, where it's sprayed, and it's sprayed throughout uh, the entire country, including Central California, where rates of parking people are especially high. Um, and the company who manufactured, according to the British uh, investigative journal, The Guardian, knew about its risk. The company that manufactured Paraquat knew about its risk. Secret files suggest that chemical giant feed weed killers linked to Parkinson's disease. They feared it for over 50 years. Did they introduce a safer alternative? No. Did they withdraw the market, withdraw the product from the market? No. They engaged in a campaign where they said they had the freedom to sell, the freedom to sell this chemical, and they sought to derail the nomination of a key EPA advisor, who actually is my colleague, Dr. Debbie Cora Schlechta, uh, not coincidentally, I think a woman that they said was overly opinionated, and they prevented her from serving on an EPA advisory panel about pesticides, and in turn, had a industry-friendly uh, scientist uh, serve in her place. 
Um, so this is a timeline that, that was laid out in the article, The Guardian. So if you just search Guardian and Paraquat, you'll find this great article. Um, so in 1962, they introduced uh, Paraquat into the United Kingdom, then later in the United States. In 1964, so this is before I'm born, they find skin exposure to Paraquat in very high doses in rabbits causes weakness and uncoordination. Two years later, the company's own scientists, not academic researchers, the company's own scientists find that large doses of Paraquat, some uh, rats and mice results in a stiff gait or tremor. 1966. 1974, regulators are concerned about workers who, quote, might inadvertently lick small quantities of Paraquat residue off their lips or inhale Paraquat mist. That's how concerned they are about the toxicity. They circulate the EPA might favor banning it. This is two years after I'm born. It's still not been banned. Autopsies of farm workers exposed to Parkinson's, I mean, to Paraquat show degenerative changes in the cells of the Samson nigra. That is the pathological feature of Parkinson's disease. Company memo uh, was concerned about a scientific article that showed an extraordinarily high correlation, 0.967. So something that's perfectly correlated, like say height and basketball players, which isn't even perfectly correlated, is, would be one. So this is a higher degree of correlation than between height and playing basketball. Extraordinary high correlation, 0.967, between levels of pesticide use and Parkinson's cases. Memo, internal memo warns that Paracot could become a huge liability and like as, as best as his Parkinson's can go on for decades. And they're correct. Um, so what is all this about? Um, so I sent this to my uh, friend who's an English professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. I'm at Ray's his name. He says, Ray, this is agnotology. And I go, what? And he goes, agnotology. And I go, what's agnotology? Uh, agnotology is the deliberate production of ignorance often for commercial gain. So, you know, scientists, we try to produce knowledge. Agnotology is the production of ignorance, often for commercial gain. Uh, highlighted by the tobacco companies who knew about the risk of smoking. Remember all those tobacco executives raising their right hand in Congress and then lying uh, through their teeth and saying that we don't know about it, we need more research, it's not been proven, da 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 da. Um, their slogan was, doubt is our product, and uh, that's exactly what's happened uh, to pesticides. And this is going on for pesticides and Parkinson's disease. You should ask what other chemicals this is going on for for Parkinson's disease and what other chemicals this is going on for what other conditions. Because we've been had. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, it's called um, Gramoxone. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Gramoxone is its brand name. So just like all drugs, you know, have a chemical name and a brand name for the pesticide. So now I'm going to turn to my uh, chemical, trichloroethylene. I carry it around with me everywhere I go. Um, so this thing, um, really simple. So we said Paraquat was developed in the 1950s. This is developed in the first, first produced in 1864. So that's the Civil War. And it's been around since the 1920s. So we're using a chemical from the 1920s. So none of us would step in an airplane from the 1920s and none of us would likely ride in a car from the 1920s because we expect engineers to develop safer alternatives and i think you could do the same for a dry cleaning chemical and a chemical that's widely used in degreasing so this chemical has been used to decaffeinate coffee uh in the 1970s widely widely used to degrease metals so if you worked in anything to do with degreasing metals automobile mechanic uh, engineer nasa uh, Air Force, um, you were likely exposed to PCE, and PCE was uh, used to dry clean clothes until about the 1950s when it was replaced by a similar uh, chemical called perchloroethylene that is um, also uh, linked to Parkinson's disease. This is research done by my colleagues, Dr. Sam Goldman and Dr. Caroline Tanner, who are, um, are at University of California, San Francisco. Uh, this was done uh, 10 years ago. They looked at twins who ha either had worked with the chemical or had hobby exposure to it. And they found that those twins who had occupational or hobby exposure had a 500% risk, six-fold increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease compared to their twins who did. Right. 
So um, if you live in a rural area, I think pesticides would be the likely cause of your Parkinson's disease. If you live in an industrial area or suburban or uh, urban area, I think this is it. I agree completely. Um, just like you know you don't smoke a cigarette, you, get part, you don't get lung cancer the next day, they found there's a lag between 10 to 40 years. So you worked with this, you got exposed to it, and 10 to 40 years later you develop Parkinson's disease. Yes, sir. Yeah, so it's amazing. So you take your, you pick up your dry cleaning, you put it in your car, your car's indoor air concentration of perchlorethane or PCE will rise. If you live in an apartment building above a dry cleaner, so think like New York City apartment buildings, you know, th the ground floor is often a dry cleaner. Yes, you're good. And so you will find perchlorethylene PCE, this is one I keep pouring, in the indoor air of your apartment. You will open your refrigerator. Uh, PCE and PCE dissolve in grease. So they're like, they're like soap, right? So that's the way they wash away grease. You uh, look at your butter, your margarine, and cheese. You'll find PCE in your butter, margarine, and cheese. You don't even need to be in the same building. You can be in a nearby supermarket, and you can find it now. You bring your kid in uh, to pick up your dry cleaning. He's eating an ice cream cone. Guess what's in his ice cream cone by the time he leaves? So, uh, th yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, the plastic bag. and so as bad as PC is for Parkinson's disease, is nothing compared to what it does for cancer. So this carcinogenic to humans, according to the health, World Health Organization, EPA says it's carcinogenic to human by all routes of exposure. So you can inhale it, you can be working with it uh, on your skin, you can be drinking contaminated water uh, with it. Um, Exposure to PCE associated with excess of incidence of liver cancer, kidney cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate cancer, and multiple myeloma. And it also is likely linked to breast cancer and uh, breast cancer and brain cancer. So um, Mr. Neal was uh, saying it's everywhere, and he's right. So here are the this is a partial list of occupations associated with uh, PCE exposure. So aircraft mechanics, automobile, anyone working in the automobile industry, dry cleaners, obviously, painters, printers, refrigerant manufacturers, sewage workers, shoemakers, water treatment workers, varnish workers, commercial and uh, consumer uses, carpet cleaners, decaffeinated coffee, glue, gun cleaners, lubricants, stain removers, member typewriter correction tool, member whiteout, uh, industry uses. Uh, 1970, two pounds per American. Two pounds per American is the PCE uh, per year. If you have stories, you're going to tell me in the Q&A, and you can tell me the stuff. And if you don't want to stay in public, you can just email me at info at ndingtv.org. This is how I learn. <laughs> so my uh, father, one of my friends, uh, is an obstetrician, gynecologist. He goes, Ray, PCE was used in obstetrics. And I go, really? Um, so this is from uh, Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Trilene. Trichloroethylene is a potent analgesic drug. Its margin of safety and ease of administration will ultimately make it a standard agent on all delivery floors. Trilene's wide variety of uses will probably allow almost every obstetrician to find a place for it in, in his obstetrical practice. Um, so this was use was banned uh, 21 years later uh, by the FDA. Um, PCE been around since 1920. Uh, its toxicity was first documented in an article by a physician from Cincinnati, Ohio, who worked for Chrysler Corporation. He wrote a letter to, letter to the editor of JAMA, entitled The Toxicity of Trichloroethylene. He said, I, um, this is a great industrial solvent. It's a great degreasing agent. But I'm a little concerned about its safety. Uh, I put it on the skin of rabbits. They died in uh, weeks, if not days. I had rabbits inhale it in trivial amounts, and they died in days, if not hours. He wrote that article in 1932. Um, TCE is found in half of Superfund sites uh, throughout the United States. Uh, New Jersey has, I think, the most. It's found, you know, in Pennsylvania, found in New York State, uh, found in uh, California. So half of the w country's most toxic Superfund sites are contaminated with this single chemical. And so uh, you say, you know, Doc, I didn't work with it. I didn't drink decaffeinated coffee in the 1970s. 
and I say fantastic, um, that doesn't mean you weren't exposed to it. So uh, many industrial plants, dry cleaners, military sites have used it, uh, either leaks uh, from like sewage lines or is inappropriately disposed of dumped. It goes down 15 plus feet through the soil and then goes into the groundwater. And then the groundwater can form underground rivers that can migrate a mile or more. And then that chemical can evaporate into people's homes, schools, and workplaces. So like many of you know, you know radon evaporates from your from thing. And how many people have their home tested for radon at some point in time? Right? So radon evaporates from the soil and causes lung cancer, so you have radon tested, and if you have radon, you find radon in your home, it's not really that big a deal. You just put a radon remediation system in place that sucks the air from underneath your foundation and vents it above. PCE does the same thing, but it's almost never tested. Actually, I've never heard of anyone uh, tested for it. If you've had it tested for, let me know. And it can be remediated and prevented by the same way that you do it for radon. So uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, how many of you know about Camp Lejeune? So the marine base in North Carolina is contaminated with PCE. It was contaminated with PCE at levels that were more than 3,000 times that uh, deemed to be safe, affecting one million Marines, their family members, uh, and the civilians who worked at the base from the 1950s to the 1980s. Uh, research coming out, what time is this? 32 minutes ago, a study just came out uh, demonstrating that Marines who served at Camp Lejeune have a 70% increased risk of developing Parkinson's compared to Marines who served at Camp Pendleton. Um, so there are thousands. You don't need to be a Marine. Uh, you don't need to serve a military site. So this is a picture of a automobile manufacturer that contaminated um, the groundwater with PCE. And then you can see this plume traveling a mi more than a mile. And so if you live on top of this plume, or you go to school on top of this plume, or you work on top of this plume, you're likely being exposed uh, to PCE. There are lots and lots of sites in Pennsylvania. For some reason, I couldn't find lots of sites in Pittsburgh, but that gets me concerned because it's almost everywhere. So I worry about people concealing risks. Um, and then, you know, at uh, East Palestine, o Ohio, vinyl chloride also causes cancer. It's not been well studied in Parkinson's disease, uh, but these sites are everywhere. Um, some of you mentioned rivers, so I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Civil Action? No one? Civil Action? So this is PCE, which contaminated the drinking water in Woburn, Massachusetts, leading kids in Woburn, Massachusetts to develop and die from leukemia in the 1970s. And so it's uh, it depicted in the book and a movie, Civil Action, nice movie to watch. Uh, also in Tom's River, New Jersey, uh, author Dan Fagan won a Pulitzer Prize for doing this, but it continues to go on and on. I think that was in the 80s or so, but I'm not like 100% sure, but if you just look, you'll find it. Yes, sir. So it's really, really simple. It's only six atoms. Um, so it's, I think it's produced from ethane and then uh, a couple small chemical steps in this process. I'm a neurologist, not a chemist, uh, but, um, but it's uh, relatively easy to manufacture. And you can still buy it. You could search on Amazon and you know, buy yourself a 55-gallon drum. So 30% of groundwater, up to 30% of groundwater in the United States is contaminated with PCE. So that's all the bummer thing, but this is all the good news. And we're going to, it's preventable because it's man-made, it's preventable. So what's the evidence for that? So only one study that I know that showed a decrease in the incidence of Parkinson's disease, and that was in the Netherlands between 1990 and 2000. Researchers found a 60% decrease in the incidence of Parkinson's. That means the number of new cases of Parkinson's disease adjusted for age decreased by 60%. That's crazy. So I went back and I said, well, let's look at air pollution. Turns out that uh, nationwide emissions of common air pollutants decreased by 50% between 1990 and 2012. Air pollution in the United States as a whole, air pollution in Western Europe is much better 
uh, than it used to be. So that's some silver lining. We saw the dramatic decline. Air pollution in London today is 1 20th of what it was in 1800. So there's some good news. Pesticides, they get rid of pesticides. Many pesticides dissolve in fat. Your brain's covered in fat. And they looked at pesticides that are known to be linked with uh, Parkinson's, including, this, including DDT. The metabolites in the fat between 68 and 86, in just 18 years, dropped between 75 and 90%. We get rid of Paraquat, we can get rid of Parkinson's disease, a lot of it. We get rid of Paraquat and other pesticides. The United States did ban a pesticide called Chlorpyrifos a year or two ago, uh, and that's linked to Parkinson's disease and uh, developmental delay. We can get rid of it. Trichloroethylene, Netherlands, 1981, levels of airborne CC levels are among the lowest in all of Europe. So at the same time, you know, 16 years, 17 years, years it took from the March of Dimes until Jonas Salk developed a vaccine uh, for uh, polio. You're going to see the same thing being played out in about the same timeline for Parkinson's. Needless to say, if you have Parkinson's, you should avoid all, all of these things. Air pollution, some small studies have suggested that air pollution, for example, increases your risk of hospitalization if you have Parkinson's. Um, so we can create a world where Parkinson's is increasingly rare. Has anyone read this book, What We Owe the Future? So my son's a philosophy student. Like, he teaches me everything I need to know. The aggregate can speak. It's good to know. Who's the Derek Parfit? Anyone know who Derek Parfit is? Exactly. So I said the same thing. Like, Dad, who's Derek Parfit? No, he goes, Dad, he's only the most prominent philosopher of the last half of the 20th century. How do you not know who Derek Parfit is? <laughs> so one of his the protégés of Derek Parfit is this guy, William McCaskill, who's like in his 30s. And so he wrote this book uh, called What We Owe the Future. And he points out that um, uh, our impact on future generations, it can be enormous. So you think about how many more humans are going to live in the future based on uh, what we do. So like think about the eradication of smallpox. That killed like 50, 250 million people. How many people of us are alive because uh, previous generations have gotten smallpox? And so previous generations, as I alluded to, have done huge things. I told you about the March of Dimes, a 17-year difference. Think about drinking and driving. So MAD was formed, I forgot where the daughter was. I, I forgot, I'm in Pennsylvania. Following the death of a woman, uh, following the death of her daughter, formed Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Eight years later, drunk driving becomes illegal in all 50 states. It wasn't even illegal in 19. Uh, also raised the drinking age, also uh, set the 0.08 as a threshold. Today, drunk driving is just socially unacceptable. So I have a parent of four, uh, uh, they're not even boys anymore, they're young men. But you know, that was the one talk I didn't have to say, like, they were like, looked at me like, people drink and drive? I mean, it would just be like unimaginable to them that people would do uh, such a thing. HIV, so uh, many of you remember HIV in the early 80s. You know, people were dying, dying rapidly from uh, unknown virus. Uh, the federal response was largely absent. Um, they adopt the motto of silence equals death. Eight years after ACT UP forms, the first protease inhibitors are improved. Uh, people like Michael J. Fox, I mean, not Michael J. Fox, people like um, Magic Johnson or you know are alive because you know when he was diagnosed everyone thought he was going to die he's alive because he was born at the right time because uh, about three years you know, about four years after he was diagnosed uh, medicines came and people lived today HIV is both preventable and treatable you think about how many of us don't have HIV because of people like ACT UP and so we can do the exactly the same thing for Parkinson's disease if more near Americans can do it for polio if mothers can do it for drinking and driving and if gay men in New York City and uh, San Francisco who are marginalized can do it for HIV, why can't we do it for Parkinson's? And so we just need to end our silence. So the HIV activists said silence equals death. For us, I think silence for the Parkinson's community, silence equals suffering. And I think it's needless and I think it's preventable suffering. I know that's a little bit hard to take in, but it's crazy, right? We've brought this upon ourselves. We need to end this so that future generations don't suffer it. You guys all know how bad Parkinson's disease is. Michael J. Fox in his interview says Parkinson's sucks. Brian Grant in his book says Parkinson's sucks. Parkinson's is terrible. We must end our silence. So what can you do right now? You can join the PD Avengers. How many of you know about the PD Avengers? So global grassroots organizations formed and run by people with the disease. So you can just join PD Avengers. It's free to do so. You can sign up for our newsletter, endingpd.org. We send out a newsletter uh, periodically. We'll probably send it out about our listening tour. That's how we 
uh, connected to uh, Casey and Christine. You can do that right now on your phone. You can go to ndcd.org and you can type it in. Or if you don't uh, like your smartphone like me, you can just sign up in the back uh, and you can be on our newsletter. You, we got to make our voices heard. So I just saw uh, recently that people were covering the National Mall with long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome. I mean, if they're talking about long COVID, why aren't we doing the same thing for Parkinson's? We need to tell your representatives to ban paraquat, trichloroethylene, and perchloroethylene. Other countries have done so. We will not only prevent people from ever getting Parkinson's, we'll prevent a ton of cancer. My guess is there's at least three times as many cancers, probably more, being caused by these chemicals than Parkinson's disease. And I think these are the most common reasons for the cause of Parkinson's disease in the United States. Uh, many of you know a new bill has been introduced into Congress last Congress and reintroduced this one, a National Plan to End Parkinson's Act, which would make the federal government develop a federal plan to prevent and end Parkinson's. You can tell your representatives to endorse it. You're going to be able to read our book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, uh, momentarily. Uh, it's available on Amazon if you can't get it here. If you can't afford a copy, you're just going to email me uh, at info at endingcd.org, and then we'll mail you one. Uh, we got to hold wrongdoers accountable. So uh, some of these companies know exactly what they're doing, just like the tobacco companies know about it. Unless they're uh, held to pay and punished for their wrongdoing, they're only going to be an emboldened. They're only going to do more of it. They're only going to do more of it unless they're held accountable. And finally, I, I love your stories. I'm going to hear your questions in a second. Uh, but you can just email me at info at endingcd.org. I read all the emails that come in. Uh, because this is how I learn uh, from this. But we have a chance, you know, to be the generation that brings about the end of Parkinson's disease. And I can think of few greater gifts that neurologists or few greater gifts that people most directly affected with the disease can do than to create a world where Parkinson's disease is increasingly rare instead of increasingly common. And we should not let that opportunity go by.